a self-proclaimed forensic jeweller. Um, but what is forensic jewellery? Well, I've got a little bit of a confession to make on that front, and that is that forensic jewellery as a field doesn't actually exist yet. You see, I am a jeweller, I am a designer, I have no forensic, no policing, and no scientific background whatsoever. Feels pretty good to get that off my chest. <laughs> um, if anyone wants their money back, it's probably a bit too late. <laughs> um, but one thing that we do best as designers is dream, is imagine, ideate, and innovate. We're also really good at nicking other people's stuff. Ideas, products, services, conversations and experiences. And reappropriating, reworking and reframing those into something which is apparently new. What design allows us to do is tap into that inner child. When we're young, we play, we draw, we make stuff. We take risks. Ultimately, we're more creative. And then we grow up. We become adults. We get a mortgage and a toaster, and ultimately, we stop being so creative and so free. So design allows us to tap into that inner child and utilize fiction, impossibility, ideas that perhaps science just doesn't allow for. Design allows us to think big and filter these crazy, impossible ideas into realistic, practical solutions. Think of the technology that we see all around us. When we're young, we don't know anything about it. We don't question things, we just go for it. And while the reality of television programs such as CSI may not be the reality of forensic science today, there's nothing to suggest that these crazy ideas, these impossible ideas, cannot inspire the forensic science of tomorrow. And this is what forensic jewellery is. It's an idea. It's a concept. It's a theory. It is an exploration into the possibilities and the plausibilities of jewellery as a method of forensic identification. More generally, it is about exploring how two seemingly very disparate and completely unrelated fields might come together to exchange knowledge. In recent years, we have broadened our forensic horizons to include creative methods, such as forensic art, forensic textile science, forensic sculpture and facial reconstruction, tattoos, piercings, body modifications. So why not jewellery? So I set about on a somewhat unique journey of discovery, from jewellery designer to forensic jeweller. An identity is a notion which has fascinated jewellers for centuries and something that we have to consider every day in our work. Why do we wear jewellery? Although our jewellery does not communicate explicitly with dialogue, it inherently exemplifies something about who we are, or at the very least, the sort of person we would like to be. Jewellery is one of the oldest forms and key indicators of identity. And the act of crafting and wearing a piece of jewellery, ironically, is a notion which is far older than the science of DNA. Archaeologists have been digging up iconic artefacts for decades, continually pushing back the first known date of when our ancestors began to participate in a culture that we would recognise. Jewellery is particularly interesting in that it has no value that isn't social. It doesn't help us find food, it doesn't keep us warm. And to this day, we still participate in the decoration and adornment of our bodies in some way, shape or form. 
We might choose to be more subtle about such decoration, like me, um, or my good friend Kami here. Um, but the likelihood is that we all in this very room are wearing something or in possession of something that is unique and specific to us. Be that a family heirloom or a bespoke or handmade piece, or perhaps an adjustment to something tailor-made specifically for our needs. And this is one advantage of jewellery in terms of identification over and above our other items of personal effects. In fact, in terms of identification statistics, jewellery enjoys similar success rates to blood group and radiography. Now, whilst the idea of using jewellery as a method of forensic identification is very much still in its infancy, um, one of, one of Julie's past strengths in forensic identification so far is due to its inherently symbolic nature. Julie has personal, religious and cultural significance. It has connections to both geographic location and region. Julie might also signify a significant private or public relationship, events or life stage between individuals and unique anecdotal aspects such as lockets containing family photographs might also hold vital clues to the potential identity of a victim. Jewellery can also be physically strong as well as innately representative of our identity. There is no artefact which, which exemplifies the proverbial notion of diamonds are forever better than this 14 carat white gold diamond brooch, also known as the 9-11 brooch. Now this brooch was recovered from one of the safety deposit boxes in Building 5 of the World Trade Center. The majority of whose contents were reduced to ash. And this brooch was valued just before the incident. Um, and the, the, the jewellery was actually recovered, the diamonds in the brooch were recovered close to the same condition as prior to the incident when it was first valued, which serves as a poignant uh, reminder of a diamond's nature. Physical marks and characteristics such as hallmarks, engravings, serial numbers and inscriptions can also provide us with vital clues, particularly in terms of tracing an item's origin. Um, or determining a timeline of a piece's movements across continents. As a jeweller myself, I have my own personal hallmark that I apply to my work, which is unique and specific only to me. Serial numbers tend to be present on more higher ends or more expensive items, um, particularly watches. Rolex, Chopard, Cartier and Tiffany all apply a unique serial number to their watches, usually after the six o'clock mark of a watch dial. This serial number can be used to trace the item back to the point of purchase and often even the purchaser themselves. This was the case in the infamous Ronald Clark's investigation, whereby this Rolex perpetual uh, wristwatch led to the successful identification of Mr. Ronald Joseph Clark. Um, his body was recovered from uh, the English Canal in, in uh, 1997 and the Rolex wristwatch found on his wrist, which was one of the only identifying clues in the case at the time, um, helped to not only identify Mr. Claps but actually lead to the conviction of his murderer at the time. Due to the collaboration between Rolex and the police, the police were additionally able to identify the date and time of death within a small margin of error due to the calendar and the time the clock had stopped. A significant proportion of diamonds these days are also laser engraved at a microscopic level, um, a code which is both unknown and undetectable to a majority of diamond thieves. Um, and it's now not impossible to change or alter post-mortem or after death. Diamonds too have a great affinity to collect DNA such as skin cells, um, to such an extent that these skin cells can solidify and calcify usually around the diamond stone setting to such an extent that they require to be burned off. 
The likelihood of obtaining a swab from this matter is therefore generally relatively good. New technologies are also infiltrating the fields of both forensic science and jewellery design. Just like a human fingerprint, every diamond has a unique gem print, which is unique and specific to every individual diamond. <laughs> this can be recorded through firing a high-powered high -powered laser through the stone, which casts this beautiful sparkle pattern or gem print. So there are two main ways in which jewellery can be recovered with a body. There are associated items, items which are recovered on or with a body, and unassociated items, items which are recovered separate to a body. However, we have to be very careful not to assume that just because an item is recovered with a person, that it is actually associated or belongs to that individual. The image on the left illustrates some religious insignia, probably from a neck chain or a pendant, which was actually recovered inside the dentures of that individual. The image on the right is a radiograph taken after 9-11, um, which actually highlights an amputated hand complete with finger ring, which was found inside the thoracic cavity of a completely different individual. Jewellery may also help us by providing other clues surrounding the circumstances of an investigation. This was the case with the infamous Suffolk Strangler investigation, whereby these women were all stripped, murdered and stripped naked in all of their clothing, bar their jewellery. Also, Melanie Hall investigation, whereby Melanie's killer or killers, clearly with some form of forensic knowledge, removed all of Melanie's clothing and her jewellery, bar this one ring, which just so happened to be a treasured family heirloom given to Melanie by her grandmother. So what does the jewellery in these cases tell us about the psychology behind these acts? The notion of almost profiling a victim or their killers by jewellery is already a notion explored somewhat in the field of forensic art. This is an example of a two-dimensional post-mortem reconstruction by a forensic artist in America, which was almost solely reliant on the distinctive jewellery recovered with the victim. Even with next to no facial features depicted, this forensic art reconstruction led to the successful identification of the victim based on the distinctive jewellery found. So, this all sounds Pretty promising so far, right? Yeah. It would certainly appear that jewellery does at least have some potential to contribute as a worthwhile, useful method of forensic identification. However, what if an item isn't handmade, isn't particularly personal, um, perhaps it's not considerably expensive, what if it's a mass-produced item, indistinguishable from hundreds of thousands of others? Imagine trying to sort through all of these wedding rings recovered in the aftermath of the Holocaust, searching for a way to identify each. And unfortunately, this is a scene not all dissimilar to that recovered after disasters such as 9-11, which presents considerable uh, work and effort on the part of the investigating team. Now, where we may have once had cultural diversity through jewellery, we are now losing in our mass-produced society focused on consumption and consumerism. The increase in mass-produced jewellery, um, particularly due to the ever-unsustainable Primark generation of high street fashion stores, means it brings into question how we can possibly differentiate between what is one item of jewellery as opposed to 100 others. Although the jewellery we wear, how we dress, and how we choose to communicate our identities has the potential to inform investigators an awful lot about we as an individual, it is the subjectivity through which others choose to interpret this identity which determines the information we think we are able to glean about an individual. 
The reality is there are as many different opinions about us as individuals as there are people. So subjectivity can be a very dangerous thing in forensic science. Visual recognition is by no means an invaluable way to identify an individual. Profiling people based on what they look like and how they dress could be a very dangerous thing indeed. Can you imagine some of the assumptions people might make about me based on my visual appearance, based on my personal effects, my jewellery, lying on an autopsy table? In fact, on a daily basis, would you look at me and see someone who works with the police, a PhD student, a university lecturer, multiple degrees, published writer? Funnily enough, I've never had anyone come up to me on the street and recognise all of that based on my appearance. Quite the opposite, in fact. So, is forensic jewellery a viable field of research? Is there a need to have such a thing as forensic jewellers? To test this proposition fully over the course of my research, I have effectively had to become my own research hypothesis. I have had to become a forensic jeweller. So in 2011, I helped to design a classification system for jewellery. Um, I worked with a team of both forensic scientists and designers um, on behalf of a project for Interpol. And we worked uh, to design a way to describe and classify jewellery on an international level using Interpol's disaster victim identification forms, which are used internationally across Interpol's 190 plus member states. In 2013, um, I spent six months seconded as a designer to the National College of Policing and UK Home Office, in addition to deploying overseas for a month to work in a South African police mortuary um, following an aviation crash in the Namibian desert. Um, in October of last year, I was awarded a fellowship um, to work at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, and I spent four months researching forensic jewellery on an international level. Um, and most recently, in March of this year, um, I spent a month in Marseille in the south of France and um, following the crash in the French Alps. And I've just finished um, eight weeks of work uh, back in the UK here, helping to process and identify all of the personal effects such as jewellery from this same incident, including the recent tragic events in Tunisia. So, what of the future of forensic jewellery? Well, forensic art has taken the principles that underpin art and design and applied them within a forensic context. And if we didn't have forensic art, we wouldn't have the reconstructions of Richard III. We wouldn't have the age progressions of Madeleine McCann. What if we took the field of forensic textile science, but had that explored by a textile designer? What if we took forensic jewellery and explored it using a scientific perspective as opposed to a jewellery designer's perspective? Collaboration and knowledge exchange are key to good ideas. And science cannot wholly quantify an individual because our identities are not quantifiable entities. The reality is that there is no foolproof method of identification because there is no foolproof means of identity. However, if we can continue to build and hone the suites of forensic techniques at our disposal, then that can surely only be a positive thing. So keep dreaming, don't lose that inner child, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>